Every time I watch it, I'm like, no, wait, hold on, stop the car. And I know what's going to happen. Isn't that bad? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, thank you all so much for allowing me to be here today. Uh, before I get started, I just want to pray, okay, that the Lord speaks today and not Ken Bell. All right? Father, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you so much for this campus. I thank you so much for the leadership of this campus. God, I pray that you do an awesome work in us. Father, we're not just coming to another chapel just to sit in and listen and leave or to speak or to play or whatever we do for your kingdom. Father, we desire for our lives to be changed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's my only desire. So, Father, I pray that as I speak this morning, Ken gets out of the way. And, Father, you show up. Lead our hearts and guide our hearts into righteousness. It is in your son Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, um, I am just, like I mentioned, I'm delighted to be here. And when I look at the movies, I think about uh, Hollywood and, and their response to Courageous and Fireproof and Facing the Giants and, and Flywheel. And I think about uh, their, 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 their definition of success. And by the world's standards, uh, Courageous and Fireproof were a tremendous success. Uh, looking at the box office numbers, both of those movies made over $30 million. So when people look at that, they say, man, that is incredible for a Christian movie to make that much money. But it's not the success by money that we look at. The first thing is, was God pleased? Was God pleased and was he glorified? Number two, were lives changed? Every day I'm getting emails. I can tell where the movie shows at because I get like a thousand new friend requests. All right, on Twitter and also on Facebook. It showed in Nigeria like a couple days ago. I started getting all these people from Nigeria asking for a friend request. I said, well, praise God. God, you're doing great things. The movie's gone all over the world. Uh, I've been on CNNBC. I've been on Huckabee and all these different types of places. And, and every, th every place someone could hope to be and, you know, and tell about on live television, tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, even on Fox News, I had one of the, the reporters try to challenge me. Uh, I, I, I talked about, uh, he said, well, why do you do movies? Because none of us get paid. He said, why do you do movies? I said, we do movies to change lives. And he said, what do you mean by that, change lives? I said, well, I said, the reason why I do movies or the reason why I act is because I want to see lives changed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is just an avenue for us to do that. He said, well, time for a commercial break. All right, we, this is Ken Bevel, you know, you know. So he just went off and switched to another. But I am so grateful that God is using movies to reach a generation. It's incredible. It is incredible. But while I tell you about that, I first got to tell you about me, where I came from, okay? Because I've never acted a day in my life. Besides being a tree in a preschool play, that was the most <laughs> that I have ever acted. Ever. Ever. You see, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, loved my family. Uh, I was in one of those neighborhoods where we were all poor, but we didn't know we were poor because everybody around us was poor, okay? Y'all know what I'm talking about? And I grew up in that neighborhood. I loved my family, loved my dad, loved my mom, and I had three sisters and one brother, and everything was just great. You know, going to school, living out my life, going to church every now and then, but, 
for the most part, we had a really good life. Well, around the time I start turning around eight years old, I start seeing a big change in the atmosphere of my family. You see, my dad, although he spoke about God, he never knew God. So he wouldn't go to church, he would stay home, watch football while we go to church. Hey, y'all guys have a good time. I'll see you when I get back, when you get back. And my dad started light drinking just drinking here and there. We went from light drinking to heavy drinking. From heavy drinking to marijuana, from marijuana to heavy drugs, and I saw my father's life slip down the tubes. And of course, if his life slipped down the tubes, so goes the rest of our family. Here is my mother, five children, my dad. Friday night was the worst night for me. You know why? Does anybody know why Friday night was the worst night? That was the day he got paid. Friday night he would come home and I would just, laying in the bed as a kid, I could remember all the fights and I just tried to push my head in the pillow just a lot more so I couldn't hear all the screaming and the fighting. Where's the money? Where's the money? You know, we need the lights, we need food, we need water. And I just, oh, that scarred me. So I started going down the road. So as a man, I had to feel Accepted. I wanted someone to love me for me. I wanted, I wanted to feel accepted. I wanted someone to stand in the crowd and say, good job, son. You're doing great. Hang in there. But I never saw it. Every basketball game I went to, I always, just for a brief moment, just peek up in the stands, did he make it this time? And he never made it. So I turned to the streets. I started drinking, doing drugs all these different things, looking for acceptance in all the wrong places. At the age of 17, I knew three things were going to happen to me. One of three things were going to happen to me. I'm either going to be dead, in jail, or on drugs. One of the three things were going to happen. All the statistics were against me. Black male, coming from a black, bad neighborhood, parents separated, nobody in my family is going to college. I said, you know, I'm bound. One of these three things is going to happen to me. So I left there. I joined the Marine Corps. Hoorah! Where else can I go and do all those things I just talked about and get paid for? it? The Marine Corps. <laughs> Y'all didn't get that, did you? Yeah. <laughs> so I joined the Marine Corps. Loved everything about it. Loved the manly aspects of it. Loved the, the, the camaraderie, uh, the, the physical fitness of it. I loved every bit of the Marine Corps. And I joined it, and I joined it right before the Persian Gulf. So as soon as I enlisted, we sailed right to the Persian Gulf. And we came back. And I mean, we were just on a cloud nine. And when I came back, all those old habits that I did in the streets, all those things, drugs, all that stuff, it just carried over right to where I was. Because you see, this is what happens. A lot of people think that if I just change the place that I am, my mind will change. That's not the way it works. My mind was still the same, just in a different place. So I started doing all these things and going here and going there, hanging out, hanging out with the wrong crowds, and all these things were happening. And, and, and I knew it was coming to a head. So one day, my first sergeant, he calls me into his office. He says, Corporal Belville, he said, let me tell you something. He said, I know what you're doing during your off-duty time. He said that if you don't stop it, you're going to prison. What prison in the military means, you get a court-martial. And that's where you go to a federal penitentiary. I said, yeah, right. You know, that'll never happen to me. I walked out of his office, went back to doing the same things I was doing. I said, I can switch some things up over here, change some things around just a little bit, and they'll never catch me. A few weeks later, he called me back in his office. He said, stand at attention. I stand at attention in front of his desk. He starts reading me my rights. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you... And I was like, whoa, stop, stop, stop. You don't have to do this. He said, no, I have to. Because all of my life, I've never had to face the music until then. I stood there while he read me my rights. He says, I know about people like you. It takes drastic measures for you to change. So I'm going to recommend to the commanding general that he gives you a court-martial. 
and we're just going to get rid of you. And man, I'm telling you, my heart was torn to pieces. So I go back to my barracks room. I can remember it like it was yesterday. Jacksonville, North Carolina on 8th Street. The third barracks on the right up on the third deck. I go to my room. The first thing I think about, should I just commit suicide? Just leave it all here. Just, just let it all go. Because, you, because you, you understand this, is that when you sin, sin has consequences. And those consequences will get so hard that you feel like you can't even bear it. You'll say, I don't want to do this. I don't want to face the, face the consequences of this. I just want to get away. Because, you see, everyone in the family was looking at me because I was the first one to finally get away. So here I am in that barracks room, and I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm like, man, I should just end it all right here. The second thing I thought about, I said, well, why don't I just run away? I just get in my car and just, just drive across the country. And, 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 and sooner or later, they'll find me, but I won't have to put up with the embarrassment nor the shame right here in this moment. And then the third thing that I thought about. You see, my mother had always prayed for me. At my most despicable moment, she was still praying for me. And I remember her saying, the day that you hear the Lord's voice, don't harden your heart. So I got down on my knees right there in that bags room, and I said, Lord, I don't know who you are. I've only heard about you. But if you don't come right here, right now, and meet with me, I'm going to lose it. And right then, it almost felt like the Lord entered that room and just wrapped his arms around me ever so gently. And it was like he said, it's okay. It's okay. And from that moment, my mind was changed. Something had happened in that room that transformed my entire life. And as I got up off my knees, I said, I don't know what just happened, but I feel a peace that surpasses understanding. You know when scripture talks about a peace that surpasses understanding, that keeps your heart and mind in Christ Jesus? That's what happened to me right there in that room on 8th Street in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. So here I am. I get up out of my seat. They're still going through with their process of prosecuting me for a court-martial offense. So I'm going through with all these things. I'm meeting investigators, and all these things are happening. And, and I go in this Walmart parking lot of all places. I'm walking through the parking lot, and three guys start approaching me. I say, uh-oh, this doesn't look good. Either these brothers are from the hood or they're from the church. One of the two. <laughs> So I'm walking. I say, well, either way it goes, I'm, I'm heading right toward them. I start walking toward them. The guy says, hey, man, come here. Let me talk to you. I said, all right. I said, he said, man, are you saved? I said, no, but I need to be. And right in that moment, in a Walmart parking lot in Jacksonville, North Carolina, I raised my hand and accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Is that awesome? That's awesome. The Lord met me right at my point of need. So I, 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 I got saved right here in that parking lot. I start going to this church and, you know, being discipled and, 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 and all throughout this time, still going through this process of court martial, still, st things are still happening. And, and I'm like, okay, you know, what's going to happen? But, but now I have a peace in my heart. I'm saying, you know what? Whatever happens, happens. I'm okay with it. And then this lady shows up on our base. We have in the Marine Corps this person called a monitor. A monitor is a person that moves you around in the Marine Corps. She shows up on base. She says, hey, is your name Corporal Bevel? I said, yes, ma'am, it is. She said, I've heard about your story. I've heard about what you're going through. She said, I just want to let you know that they've dropped all the charges. Where do you want to go? I said, lady, as far away as you can send me. She sent me all the way to Japan. <laughs> And God started changing my life. 
He said, I have something for you to do, and you don't have time to waste. You know all those times where you were just playing church and you were going to church, never heard the word, never planted in your heart? He said, I've got something for you to do, and you don't have, you don't have time to waste. You know what? You need, I need to hook you up some brothers that really know about what loving God really means. I need to link you up with some people that are going to teach you how to read Scripture and look at Scripture and understand what the Lord is saying. And I start meeting all these different people in different location, officers and other Marines, and, and all my roommates were saved, and it was incredible. God started putting all these people in my path, and, and every church that I went to, and every leader was like, man, I don't know, something, something, God is getting ready to do something with you. I just want to be a part of it. So people start putting me up to speak and different things, and it, was, it just started being incredible. It was incredible. No one but God can do that. Nobody. So then I get to this other duty station in Albany, Georgia, and this guy, he looks at me. He says, man, you, you, you're, you're a great looking guy. You know, you, 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 you do good on your physical fitness. Have you ever thought about being an officer? I was like, an officer? Are you serious? You got to go to college for that, right? He said, yeah. He said, but you know what? I see something special in you. I don't know what it is, but I'm willing to invest in it. So I go to college, I graduated high school with a 1.8 grade point average. Can you even graduate with a 1.8 grade point average? <laughs> Don't laugh, because most of you got a 1.8 grade point average right now. Yeah, uh-huh. I pray you don't. <laughs> with a 1.8 grade point average, after the Marine Corps almost court-martialed me a year ago, they said, we think you got great leadership potential. How does that? That doesn't even weigh out. So they say, you know what we want to do? We want to send you to college for four years. Go to the degree of your choice, you know, and we'll pay for it. I was like, wow, this is incredible. I go to college. I major in computer engineering, all right? You can tell I made a 1.8 because I went to one of the hardest courses in the school. I started praying and, and, and asking God. I said, God, the, the first day I walked on campus, I was like, man, this is incredible. I can't believe I'm in college. I was calling all my friends. Hey, man, I'm in college. I can't believe it. And God was telling, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this for my glory. Don't get caught up in this. I'm going to use this for my glory. So I start going to school, and, and, and I was going to this church and going to school, and I was going to this church, and, and, and at this church, they put a big, deep emphasis on evangelism. So I started going out into the neighborhoods, and I knew, I knew that lifestyle. I knew the drug dealers. I knew all those lifestyle things. So I would go out, and we would see tons of people getting saved, 20, 30 people. We're walking up to crack houses, knocking on doors, telling guys about the power of the gospel, and they're getting saved, and I'm seeing this huge impact for the kingdom. But here on this side, you've got the guy with the 1.8 saying, hey, I need to study. But the Lord is saying, hey, do what I've told you to do over here. But, but over here, I'm like, God, I need to study. He said, look, don't worry about that. You study when you're supposed to study. I'll give you the ability to retain all those things. You do what I've told you to do. And at the end of the semester, <laughs> the dean walks in my class and he says, Ken, he said, can you stand up, please? And I'm over on the side trying to finish up work for, for another class while he's there. He says, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say, this is Ken Bell. He said, he just graduated at the top of the class. I was like, what? Only God can do that. Because he told me, he said, look, you do what I've told you to do. I'll take care of everything else for you. Be obedient. I'll take care of everything else for you. I go on, go back in the Marine Corps as an officer. Uh, they put me with a general. I travel all over the world. I've been to every continent but South America, been in war zones, you name it. Uh, but man, I went in with a new perspective with taking the gospel to the nations. Everywhere I went, I was telling other Marines about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Marine Corps is a man's man society where nobody cries, but I was telling people about, about the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it was incredible. It was incredible. God links me up with this guy. He's a general. And I start flying around the world with him and telling him about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I just see God just starting to change lives. And all these things are happening. And then I go to Monterey, California, and I get a master's degree. And I say, they say, where do you want to go to next? I said, it's either Washington or Albany, Georgia. 
and they sent me to Albany, Georgia, and I link up this church that makes movies. A church making movies? Are you serious? I get to Albany, Georgia, and say, hey, we're, we've just produced these two movies, and we're getting ready to make another one called Fireproof. And uh, I start praying about it. I said, Lord, is this something I should do? So I auditioned for the part and got the part. Did terrible in the auditions. Terrible, all right? <laughs> terrible in the auditions. They say, hey, we're not looking for anybody who has talent. We believe that God has chosen you for this part. And if God has chosen you for this part, he'll give you everything you need. He gave me everything I need. So as I go through that story and I think about my life and see where God has brought me and the things that I've been able to experience and the people that I've been able to meet, it's not about me. It is not about me. Open your Bibles to John. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 6. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 6. And here's what it says. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him he was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. When I look at that particular scripture and I look at John's purpose, I look at my purpose. My job is to be a witness and a testimony about the light of Jesus Christ. My job is not to get out and be one of the best Christian actors on the screen. That's not my job. That's not what I was called to do. My job is to be a witness and a testimony for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. When I look at that word witness, in the Greek it means martu, mar, martu, and, and when I look at that particular word, I am to give evidence of what God has done in my life and share it with other people. You see, see, see some people get really, really mixed up, and, and especially a lot of Christian uh, 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 reformers or artists and, and, and all these things, they and they start thinking that it's all about them. It's not. It is not. Our purpose is to show forth the glory of God and tell people about the changing power of Jesus Christ. You know, when Charles Spurgeon, whenever he preached, he would walk to the, as he was walking to the pulpit, he would say, I believe in the power of, of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit all the way till he got to the pulpit. And I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that he can change lives. I don't care if you're too good. I've been in rooms where I was the only person that wasn't a millionaire. And I've been in rooms where people were blowing dope in my face. But I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit and that he can change lives. Now, the question is for you. This is the question. What are you going to do while you're on this earth? Are you going to be a witness and a testimony? Or are you going to cower down and say, you know what? I'm going to stay over here in my little holy huddle, and we're going to pray, and we're going to stay in church, and we're going to just do everything by the Bible. And, and you know, and, and I'm not worried about people that are lost. I'm not worried about people that are on the outside because that doesn't affect my life. You're wrong. We are called to go forth and tell people the gospel everywhere. You know, I, one, of the thing, one of the things that just hit me on Halloween night, I took my kids up to a church, and we picked up some candy from a church, and we were on our way back home, and we were walking home, and uh, this guy says, Happy Halloween! I was like, whatever that means. So we're walking home, and I start thinking about this, and, and people were, we got one of the areas right by our church, and, and it's probably one of the biggest, one of the, the biggest gangs in that area, 
and we're afraid, people are afraid to kind of go to the door, you know, go knocking, knocking on door because people say that's irrelevant. People don't do that anymore. People are just really so not, you know, people oriented. I say, watch, listen to this. On October 31st, people dressed their children up like demons, literally. You walk to someone's house that you don't know, you knock on the door and ask for candy, food for your children. And we're scared to go to somebody's house and tell them about the gospel. That will change their lives. Isn't that amazing? The world is so bold. And I pray that my generation, this next generation, we will be that bold for Christ. When God starts prompting your heart, talk to that person. Pray for that person. Tell that person about the gospel. Share with this person. Hey, just, just go give this person a cold drink of water. Whatever it is, you're obedient and you're responding to the gospel because that's our job and that's our responsibility if you're a Christian. Now, that's for Christians. If you're not a Christian, your time is now. If not now, then when? When are you going to do it? When are you going to give your life to Christ? No, I think I'm going to do it when I get out of college, when I get back to my home church. The Lord is calling you right now. If not now, when? If not here, then where? Where is, where is it? Where, where, where is a better place to give your life to Christ than here? And watch this. The last thing, if not you, then who? Who will do it? Who? Who? You can't live on your mother's faith anymore. You can't live on your grandmother's or your father's. You've got to submit yourself to Jesus Christ. And say, Lord, here I am. Send me. And you've got to be just like I was in that barracks room that day. Desperate for a change. Desperate to see the power of the Holy Spirit work in my heart. So that people can be saved. Are y'all hearing me this morning? It's time out. Right outside these gates, there's a whole lost world that needs to hear the gospel. And don't tell me I'm just going to school here. Don't tell me that. God placed you here for a reason, under great leadership, to impact this community with the gospel. And we should be going out. I'm not necessarily, you need to go door to door. However you do it, Lord, give me what I need to do. Give me the way that we need to go to be impactful for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tell me, I was in a prison. I had to speak in a prison in Florida a couple months ago. 450 guys gave their life to the Lord. 450 in one meeting. These are guys behind bars, ready to get out, that are fired up with the gospel. So it's our job, us that are free on the outside, to start telling people about it. Amen? So this is a challenge, and we're getting ready to close here. If you're here today and you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, today is the day. I counted the steps from that back to this front and probably from the balcony also. It's probably about 70 steps. You can come today. Why wait? God has set all this up just for you to come today. Don't leave this place the same. He did it all for you. Let us bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the power of the gospel. Because you said that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not or will not perish but shall have eternal life. God, that's the promise that we stand on. So Father, I pray that if there's anyone here today, we're not thinking about things we got to turn in, we're not thinking about what's going to happen down the road, the here and now. Lord, what do I need to do to get right with you? 
What do I need to do to ensure that I have an eternal home? I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he has the power to change your circumstance and your situation. So if you're here today and you just want prayer, I want you to come up. Just, man, just come. Just, just come. Just come. Look at the person next to you. Excuse me, I need to get out. Just come. Pray. Ask the Lord for forgiveness. Ask the Lord for his hand to be on you. I want you to come. If you're here today and you have not given your life to Christ, I want you to come. Just come. Don't worry about who's looking. Don't worry about what people are going to say. Just come. The Bible says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You're trying to do things on your own, and God says, you can't do it on your own. Give your life to me. So today, we're waving the white flags in surrender. Saying, Lord, take it. It's too much for me to bear. He says he'll take it.